disease, but also diagnosed with their systemic disease. So we're very fortunate to hear from him, uh, from his expertise in uh, eye disease and vasculitis. Thank you all. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the kind introduction. It's uh, great to talk to everybody here and give you my uh, perspective of inflammatory disease of the eye, my financial disclosures. You know, a goal as ophthalmologists are quite easy. Keep an eye looking normal for the rest of your life so you can see great. So we want to see an eye in our clinic at age 20 and essentially the same way with a normal retina and normal front of the eye. This is what uncontrolled inflammation does. Essentially, it leads to incredible structural loss where you the eye is rendered blind. The sad thing is this is the right eye and the left eye of the same patient who's 25 years old, who's counting fingers in both eyes. Essentially legally blind, no longer able to work because of uncontrolled eye disease. You guys don't hear enough. I'll tell you, it's a pleasure working with all of you on these complex patients. These are not easy. We rely on each other to accurately determine the extent and severity of disease. Our ability to directly assess structures of the eye that influence the rest of the body, like the retinal vasculature, the optic nerve, can often give insight to the systemic vasculature and the brain. Often the eye disease severity co correlates with systemic disease, but it's not uncommon for us to see eye disease and for me to send it to my rheumatology colleagues and say, well, there's nothing else that's going on. And the eye disease eye itself can be the, the source of inflammation in the body. And I always warn, when an ophthalmologist tells you something is vision threatening, it is usually vision threatening, and it warrants aggressive therapy because the difference between seeing and not seeing is sometimes half a millimeter of retina in the eye. This is a very, very small anatomy and very small real estate that we get to work with. So the eye is unique. We can see into this end organ and observe the effects of inflammatory and infectious disease in real time. The retina has significant vascular perfusion. It's probably on par with the brain and multiple other parts of the body. It mimics the kidney in many diseases. It's actually probably got very similar perfusion to the kidney. We have immune privilege at some level that actually influences the type of inflammatory disease. We have really poor uh, penetration of systemic therapy in a normal functioning eye, which warrants local therapy by us to deliver anti-inflammatories uh, anti to the eye. And the eye can be affected and every other organ system can be spared. And that's not an uncommon theme that you hear. So I'm gonna give you a little tutorial first on ophthalmology notes, because probably very hard to read and don't really understand what the heck's going on. So in general, we use the term uveitis to describe all types of inflammation. So if you hear the word uveitis, it's essentially inflammation in the eye. It's a kind of a wastebasket term. Inflammation can occur from the front part of the eye all the way to the back part of the eye. And recognition of where it is sometimes requires a very careful exam. And so this is one of the take home points why I hope you take away is don't just rely on the ophthalmologist telling you it's normal. You have to ask what did you do to ensure that it was normal and make sure a careful eye exam was done. The treatment of the inflammation is dependent on where it is and the location of the disease. And we have a really poor grading system. We grade from zero to four. It's a six step scale. It's incredibly poor at uh, assessing how well an eye is doing. So you'll sometimes hear anterior uveitis. We split up the eye based on compartments or anterior uveitis, anything in front of the iris, also known as iritis or erocyclitis. So you can look into the eye and that's a slit lamp photo of the front of the eye with multiple inflammatory cells in the anterior chamber. This is active iritis. Sometimes the inflammation is in the middle part of the eye where the inflammation is actually in the vitreous jelly. So when we look in the eye, we'll see frank white cells in the gel of the eye and they collect and they sometimes form something we call snowballs, which are just collections of inflammatory cells. And these inflammatory cells can sometimes scar and actually start to rip the retina. And then there's posterior uveitis, which is essentially anything in the back part of the eye, the retina and the optic nerve. And we can assess it sometimes by direct clinical exam using our indirect ophthalmoscopy, or we use imaging to assess what's going on in the eye. And I'll show you what these imaging tests here in a second. And sometimes it involves all layers of the eye, what we call panuveitis, meaning it just involves every single structure or multiple structures. Many of you are aware of what we call scleritis, that's inflammation of the sclera. So I gave you a cross section of the sclera and the episclera to just remind you that most of the red eyes you will see is not scleritis, it's episcleritis. So scleritis has this deep purplish hue when you look in, and episcleritis has a much more finer look. Episcleritis, I'm betting almost all of us have had one episode of episcleritis in our eye. If you have a dry eye, you get a form of episcleritis. It's very common to see, eye that's red, irritated. 
Scleritis hurts like hell. They'll tell you, I woke up last night, I can't go to bed, it's the worst thing I've ever felt. Take the eyeball out. That's how bad the, the, that it gets. Uveitis, once you have it, has a high risk of visual complications. About a third of our patients will go blind, period. If we don't do anything, they'll lose it. Worsening visual outcomes would uh, correlate with the duration of disease, number of episodes and location. Untreated inflammation leads to structural damage. And we get fun things like cataracts and glaucoma from even the best therapies, which can also lead to vision loss. So we gotta be fast, we gotta be aggressive, and we have to be persistent in how we treat these patients. Our terms are limited and our definitions are limited. So I told you about where these things are located, but sometimes it requires us to actually look very carefully. A lot of times we're basing it on clinical exam only, but we know that our imaging allows us to look at a deeper level and see unrecognized disease using our imaging tests. Our grading systems are difficult because oftentimes what somebody says is one or two plus, another person says is three or four plus. So sometimes it's very hard to assess how well a patient's doing. And ultimately we have to do some imaging. So I ask you to ask of your ophthalmologist, make it easy. Is the patient active or inactive? Start there. Is it better or worse on therapy? I know it's simplistic. Don't get into two plus, three plus, four plus, no reason. Active or inactive, better or worse. Was the patient dilated? How did the retina and nerve look? Especially for systemic vasculitic diseases, this is really important. In a vasculitis patient, was the retina vasculature image? Did you get a fluorescent angiogram, which I'm gonna show you? How did their sclera and cornea look? Because you can have ulcerative uh, keratitis. And in any patient with new inflammation who's already on systemic immune suppression, is there any chance this could be an infection? Because we see a lot of them in immune suppressed patients. And do these patients have steroid complications? Hopefully we're looking at that for you. These are some of the tests that we use. This is a fundus photo, pretty easy. That's the picture of the back of the eye. This is the most powerful test in my mind because I'll see 70 patients in a day. It's impossible to do that. You gotta look at a picture sometimes and actually see and stare at them because I get seconds, minutes sometimes on a patient and I can stare at a photo after hours and stare at it and stare at it and then call Rula and say, I was wrong, let's do something different. It's a really powerful way for us to assess how these patients are doing over the long haul. We have the ability then to look at the retina at a very fine structure by doing something called an optical coherence tomography or OCT. It's the most powerful, most common test that we use in imaging and ophthalmology. It gives us essentially the structure of the retina at a photoreceptor level. We can see photoreceptor or the assessment of photoreceptors using this technology and it's non-invasive. And then my favorite test is intravenous fluorescein angiography. And the reason why it's my favorite test is it allows the assessment of retinal vascular perfusion. Goes through an IV, five to 10 minutes later, you'll get a picture of the retinal vasculature. And on the, your left-hand side is the patient's right eye. That's quite normal. On the right-hand side, that's an abnormal fluorescein. You can see the brightness is a little bit more in the center part of that picture. You can see there's a lack of perfusion in the center. This is a patient with lupus and APLS who has lost central perfusion in their foveal area. So this is a very quick way and powerful way to assess how well this patient's doing and understand what's going on with their systemic disease. We have some new technologies that allow us the same assessment without actually using dye. This is something called OCT angiography. So that same patient who had APLS, we can actually watch this patient over time and you can see the perfusion is limited here. And you don't need to be an ophthalmologist to understand that the perfusion is improving just over time, just with this non-invasive test. This is becoming more and more powerful for us to assess these patients and can be done in seconds to assess how the patient's doing. One of the questions we get asked a lot is, should we screen our systemic vasculitic patients? And I think that always comes down to, it depends on the series you read. So depending on the where you are and such, some people will tell you the rates are super high. So this is a really nice paper on GPA in France, looking at about 308 new patients with GPA. And they found about 63 of these patients had some form of ophthalmic disease. Now, most of the ophthalmic disease was scleritis, but some of it was dry eye. So dry eye is not vision threatening. It's annoying, but it's not vision threatening. But oftentimes there were some significant findings in this. About 15% of these patients presented with eye disease first before the diagnosis of GPA. Sometimes it occurs at the same time, but oftentimes a third of the time it will happen once they're on therapy. In those with eye involvement, eye disease drives therapy about 20% of the time. 
And so that's hard sometimes because we're trying to help you make an assessment of what to do. And sometimes, again, we have to communicate that really well to you. And eye disease, especially in GPA, is incredibly refractory to antimetabolite therapy. I'm gonna show you some cases of that here in a second, and often requires a biologic agent in order to control. Not universal, but in this series, and at least my experience, that's been something very similar. There are higher rates of co-ocular comorbidity even in asymptomatic patients. There are this one series looking at patients with APLS and lupus that showed that about 37% of patients asymptomatic had some sort of ophthalmic symptoms and findings. So you read this paper and you're like, oh my God, a third of my patients are walking around with something. But again, you read the paper again and you're like, well, some of these are hypertensive changes of the retinal vasculature, which really don't impact vision. Some of these patients have dry eye, but seven to 10% had retinal vascular thrombosis, and that's something real. So how do you, you know, assess this, and how do you tease this out? And what I, I say to patients is, once ocular inflammation is diagnosed, coordination is vital. It's easy. We are going to work together on it. Active ocular inflammation is active inflammation, but if you have a patient who's sitting there in your office, and you're like, well, should I have this patient screen? I have the three questions. How are you seeing? How does your eye feel? Have you, has your vision changed recently? That's it. Most of the time, you'll capture most of those patients who have something new going on. And if you're not sure, send them over. But look, we'll tell you very, very quickly what's going on. When they have active disease and active eye disease, it does warrant that we work together. And we warrant that we stay very aggressive with these patients. And that one of the things that's important is sometimes we're seeing something before you'll see it. It's coming, we're just the first organ system to assess it and to realize it, but it means the whole patient itself is pretty active. So there are correlations between active eye disease and systemic outcomes. There are not a lot of papers out on this. There's one really nice one that just showed that patients in RA who had extra uh, severe eye disease were more likely to have rates of severe extraarticular RA than those who didn't. That's not uncommon, I think that makes sense to us. But the 10-year ten, the ten survival, because these patients were treated, were similar. So didn't really treat survival, just meant that their risk of disease went up. So um, what I, in general, tell when people ask me, what do you do or how do we treat these patients? I say, well, we're doing this together. So in general, once ocular inflammation occurs, the degree, this disease requires probably more immune suppression. When it's ocular inflammation only, from our own data in the ophthalmology world, antimetabolites work 50 to 70 percent of the time. That's all uveitis together. It's not nuanced. We're just throwing it out there based on the, our previous data. It's 50 to 60 percent on some of our prospective look, 50 to 70 percent when you look at retrospectively. But it's very clear for the systemic vasculitic disease who have eye disease, the presence of active ocular disease usually will warrant some sort of biologic therapy. These are small case series at best. Sometimes you'll get 20 to 30 patients in a series. But in general, I'll tell you, just looking at these patients over the past 20 years I've done this, if you have GPA, Bichette's, Susac syndrome, I can guarantee you you're probably going on a biologic. It's usually the case. Steroid supplementation is usually used either via local steroid injections. Sometimes we do topical steroid drops. And the local steroid things we use usually are short term. We have some long term ones that last years. I can give an injection of a steroid that lasts three years in an eye, but it's low dose. It doesn't always knock all inflammation out, it knocks out some. So if your patient notices visual symptom, get an eye exam. If the eye exam shows some inflammation, assess severity. This is something you got to ask the ophthalmologist to do for you. Sometimes you need to switch ophthalmologists. It's okay. They'll be all right. There's plenty of us out there. But if they don't have an expertise in inflammation or don't really seem interested, move on. Find somebody else because it's going to help you. You notice something, I'm going to believe you. When I get a call from the rheumatology service that something's not right, everything stops. They come over because there's something real in these patients. And sometimes you need assistance on a diagnosis. You're suspicious that this patient has a systemic vasculitic component. Sometimes our imaging will be helpful, not universally. Five to 10% of the time, I'm kind of smart. Most of the time it's normal and everything is okay. I'm not really helpful. But every once in a while, we'll be able to pick up something that actually helps these patients and make an assessment for them. So I thought it, and I think I have 10 minutes, five minutes, you tell me when. You just cut me off because I have a couple cases. Just show you how, how, how some of this works. This is a 31-year-old female who presented with sudden vision loss, um, flu-like symptoms for six days ago, four days ago had uh, pain in, over her entire body, seen the emergency room and diagnosed with a viral infection, but she was sent to the ophthalmology clinic for assessment. Um, I was 
actually at Metro trying to drive home because I hadn't seen my wife for a couple of days because I was at a meeting and my chairman called me and said, I have a really interesting case for you to see. And that's never good. So I canceled my date night with my wife. So a vision is hand motions and 2200. So essentially blind in both eyes. That's her look. And so that's her retina, the right eye on your left hand side and your retina on the left eye. You don't need to be an ophthalmologist to know that doesn't look right. But you can see the amount of hemorrhage. You can see the vascular sheathing, and you can see these yellowish, whitish deposits throughout the whole retina. This is a kind of a classic look of one particular disease. You guys see more than we do. But this other thing that you're going to see is the fluorescing angiogram, which shows poor perfusion in the retinal vessels leak. So we know there's active vasculitis, so there's a retinal vascular leakage. And that OCT test shows me that the retina, which normally has about 250 microns of thickness, has about a full 900 to 1,000 microns of thickness. So that's not a retina that's going to see well. It's pretty swollen. I'll show you and you guys can make the diagnosis because it was obvious not to me, but to everybody else, that once I show you these hands and these elbows, it's kind of clear that what she has is dermatomyositis. So this is a patient with dermatomyositis who was recently pregnant, currently postpartum, came off of her immune suppression, decided not to go back on it, and presented rapidly with vision loss. So probably it's been smoldering for a bit. We all know that postpartum can do this in ophthalmology and UVI this happens especially. So this was a call. It was a call to the rheumatology service. It was a call to our mission service. How do we handle this patient? How do we get this patient getting better? We're going to admit her. We're going to start on IV side of I gave multiple injections of medicine into her eye to try to calm it down. This could be infectious as well. So we worked her up for infectious disease. That's what she looked like on the first day. But within a week, she's getting better. Her OCT, that swollen vessel, the swollen retina, has improved within a week. So she's already starting to see better. She just gave birth. She couldn't see her kid. So all of a sudden now, she's actually able to recognize faces. That's her in two weeks. That's her in a month. We now start azathioprine, and she's doing much, much better. There's two months, and that's uh, over six months. Now she's back to about 20, 40. And I've now seen this woman for the last 12 years, every year. And uh, I think I call Rula every time I do it. I was like, I can't believe this woman sees 2025. There's no possible way she should. Because that initial picture of dermatomyositis with that much foveal involvement usually portends poor outcomes. But what we were lucky on is we got her treated aggressively quickly. So severe vision threatening rat retinal vasculitis, if you have any chance of restoring vision, it happens yesterday. It happens immediately. It happens with aggressive systemic and local therapy. You gotta be lucky as well. And sometimes we get lucky for these patients. I'm going to show you two kind of similar cases in a row, and then maybe I'll, I'll, I think I have one other one after that. But I'll show you this is a 25-year-old male who comes to us. When people see us, they don't think we're doctors. I'm going to let you know that. We're optometrists at best, and I don't need to know anything else beyond their history of eyeglasses and what brand of contact ones they use. So what we say is in our office, we try to get a full history, and all I'll get is I'm in the hospital recently. That's all we'll get. 2025, 2020 in the left eye, significant scleral injection in the right eye. In the back of his right eye, as we look in, you can kind of see it that his retinal vessels look a little more torturous on the right side the, than the left side. So this is my first clue, something's not right. He sees well, but he's got scleritis and he's got retinal vasculature involvement. So that to me is really strange and really concerning because once you have the scleral involved and the retinal vasculature, that number of things that it can be go down, it uh, becomes smaller and smaller. So this is his fluorescing angiography, which shows me that all of his retinal vessels are leaking. So he's got significant vasculitis. That's his other eye. Again, you don't need to be an ophthalmologist. You can tell the difference between those two pictures. So this list is small, thankfully. When I see scleritis plus vasculitis, it's the top four until proven otherwise. Sometimes it's tuberculosis, sometimes it's Bichette's, but almost universally in a young guy, it's GPA until proven otherwise. So it turns out when you ask him more than his contact lens history and his hospital and his glasses history, he admits to a number of things. Being diagnosed with GPA about three months ago, getting admitted to the hospital and actually getting a workup, but he had no follow-up. He went to an outside hospital. They did all this stuff for him. I mean, put him on Cytoxan, gave him two doses and said, follow up later. This guy is slowly going blind. He doesn't realize. He's like, yeah, my vision started going, getting worse. There's his rash. I mean, again, I'm an ophthalmologist. I can figure out that's not right. So 
what do we do next? Again, this is a team-based approach. I called Carol and I said, hey, I got this patient who's got, uh, clearly got GPA and has got horrific eye disease. He's on his way to losing it. He gets admitted, everything gets started for him. And this guy has a repeat CT with new nodules and early cavitation, but on prednisone, on therapy, he gets better and better and better. And over time, he's done really great. It's five years, Carol sees him more than I do now, but this is a constant, new thing with him because he's always getting sick or something new is happening for with him so it just shows us again the severity of disease when he first pre presented often especially with eye disease often predicts that he's going to have a more severe co course i'll show you the other thing that's a little scary to me with gpa the hardest thing about gpa is not the retinal vasculitis it's patients like this who present with scleritis because their scleritis tends to be worse and very very challenging to treat this is the initial presentation of a woman with GPA, who will diagnose with GPA. So I saw her first. She came into my office with new onset of pain, light sensitivity. That's a melting sclera. So that's necrosis of her sclera. That All that redness that's there is active scleritis, but that's loss of tissue there. That's her eye about to open up in the office. So we try to avoid that. It's not good for us. We don't like to do that. Her retina looks pretty good. She has no loss of perfusion. Um, work her up and uh, call Carol after I, it's clear that this woman has uh, GPA. She does a great uh, assessment, uh, identifies the patient also has sinus disease, gets her rapidly started on therapy. So 80 milligrams of prednisone, IV pulse steroids. This is how the quick pulse steroids can work on these patients. I mean, it's pretty impressive how quickly we've turned necrosis into inactive disease. But what you'll notice is how white that center area is. That's tissue that's lost. There's no perfusion there. It's gone. It's a question of, is the eye going to hold its shape? And over the next 18 months, I think this has been a fun ride for both of us. It's, will she take her medicine? Will she show up? Will she do okay? I've given her a number of injections of steroids around the eye in order to kind of keep things calm. But over time, it's just slowly taking its time to, to get better if she would take her medicine or show up. As you all know, that sometimes that's challenging. She got COVID in between, she went on a vacation. This is her after, before, once we got her settled and then she went away for a bit. But even in an inactive eye, if you'll see that redness right at the edge, that's active scleritis on the edge of old scleritis. You remember that whole white area, that's just necrosis. So I'm just waiting for this whole thing to settle and I'm hoping the eye will just heal over this so I don't have to patch it. Sometimes I surgically have to put a patch over the eye in order to prevent this eye from opening up. She's actually holding steady over time. And here she is in April, 2023 with a stable eye. If you kind of imagine three dimensionals, that eye is pooching out. So that's her eyeball, like, you know, it should be smooth and stable. She's got a little bump on her eyelid, which is her eyeball coming out. So, so far so good. I tell her not to box, we should be okay. She's gonna do all right. So the lesson here, GPA, very, very challenging in general. The eye disease tends to be very, very uh, aggressive and long-term control is possible, but usually requires multiple agents in that sense. I think I'm over, I'm gonna call it right here, but it's always a pleasure. I will just give you my uh, email address at the end here, but, uh, oh, sorry, it's another case, so I won't do that. But thank you for the time and I'm happy to answer your questions later. Our next speaker is Dr. Parambol. Parambol uh, Dr. Parambol is a staff member of uh, the Department of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine. He's an uh, assistant professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic uh, Learner College of Medicine. Dr. Parambol has multiple uh, interests, including interstitial lung disease, pulmonary hypertension, and lung disease in, um, in inflammatory systemic diseases. Um, he is a great member in our department who sees most of our patients with um, inflammatory um, uh, systemic diseases, and we're very happy to have him here today to talk about pulmonary diseases, uh, including ILD and vasculitis. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, Rula. Uh, thanks, Carol, for inviting me to do this. Um, just like uh, Rula said, I know you you are, have been exposed to the broad spectrum of hemorrhage and nodules in anchor associated vasculitis. 
Uh, the purpose of this talk is more to talk about this up and coming entity of interstitial lung disease in anchor associated uh, vasculitis. So I'll start by this disclosure. I am not qualified to give this presentation. The only reason why I was invited is because I know the royalty of vasculitis, Matt Bunyard and Carol Langford. As you can see, my qualification is so poor that my photoshopping skills are just as bad. All right, so with that being said, uh, let me start by just giving you this busy summary slide and then we go over the points so I can make some sense of it. There is now an increased association between interstitial lung diseases and anchor associated vasculitis. The majority of cases you're gonna see is primarily gonna be in the setting of anti-myeloperoxidase, the MPO antibody. It's been described in the PR3 uh, antibody as well. It can occur with or without systemic involvement. And I'll show you CT scans. It's usually a UIP pattern, as you would see in rheumatoid arthritis, unlike the traditional NSIP, which is mainly seen in most uh, systemic inflammatory diseases. When ILD is seen, it tends to have a worse outcome in patients with anchor-associated vasculitis, and treatment is still being developed for this. All right, with that being said, the first case actually came out of the Mayo Clinic when in 1990 they saw a patient that was initially diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and subsequently developed glomerulonephritis and succumbed to the disease. And uh, they went back and looked at their records and they found two other cases. The earliest case was from 1978. And this is the uh, biopsy sections from that case that showed um, pulmonary fibrosis in somebody with subsequent development of um, ret uh, renal vasculitis that was anti-MPO positive, at least in the 1991. And interestingly enough, and we'll talk about this later, none of the lung biopsy slides showed any evidence of vasculitis, but it did show some inflammation. And that's important, keep that in uh, your fund of knowledge. Then in 1995, the Japanese described the first series of 46 patients who were anti-MPO positive, and approximately 40% of them were diagnosed with an interstitial lung disease. More and more studies started to come out from the East, from Japan, from Korea. And so it was thought that is this disease more a phenotype of our Asian patients? And even today, most of the reports of this comes from our Asian cohorts than our European cohorts. But we also know among our Asian patients with anchor-associated vasculitis, NPO anchor is far more positive. Like, as you can see in the slide over here, uh, this comparative study between Japan and the UK showed 84% of the cases were NPO positive compared to only 30% in the UK. And epidemiological studies show that there's a higher prevalence of ILD with NPO anchor positivity, like 83% of ILD cases are MPO anchor positive compared to only around 20% that are PR3 anchor positive. So it may not be just something to do with ethnicity, but it also could be something to do with the antibody profile that predisposes patients towards interstitial lung diseases. Now, the prevalence, we know ILD is seen at around 45% of MPA, 22% of GPA, and I think this is important to keep with you is that the clinical presentation of interstitial lung disease in these patients with anchor associated vasculitis almost always precedes clinical vasculitis or occurs simultaneously with the evidence of vasculitis. It is very rare for somebody to have clinical anchor-associated vasculitis, and then down the road to develop 
interstitial lung diseases. It's very odd. Most of them proceed or occur at the same time. And that becomes difficult for us to treat because these patients have interstitial lung disease, they are anchor positive, and then we call you know, the master, Dr. Chatterjee, and say, tell us what to do. And he says, good luck and God bless. So uh, the age of onset of these patients is generally older. It's around 65, unlike patients with ILD, it's younger. Since we're a little bit more male prominent. And just like this slide shows, when they have ILD, the outcomes tend to be worse than in patients without interstitial lung diseases. Um, so, just like I said, this can precede uh, clinical vascular disease. So, what do we do in patients who have a diagnosis of IPF, just like the initial case that came out of Mayo that said, oh, this patient has IPF, and then they are antibody positive. And when I mean antibody positive, both, uh, you know, the P anchor with the MPO. And this study followed patients who had a diagnosis of IPF. And you got to be mindful nowadays. So this came out in 2019. We do less and less biopsies of the lungs. And more and more of these diagnoses are made based on clinical and radiographic features. So we see a UIP pattern. We see, oh, this we call this because there isn't any other clinical stigmata of connective tissue disease. Patients can be called as IPF. But then they have this anchor that's positive, both a P anchor and an MPO, and you're like, what do I do with this information? And we know when they've followed these patients serial wrong, approximately a third of them do develop clinical vasculitis. So there is something with the presence of ILD and anchor vasculitis. And at least for us, the teaching is not to just blow this off, but to think that something could happen down the road. And the more important thing is, you guys do a fantastic job in treating these patients, but once they get pulmonary fibrosis, that's what drives the outcomes. Is there genetic susceptibility to ILD in patients with ankle-associated vasculitides? In IPF and various other interstitial, fibrotic interstitial lung disease, the classic example is rheumatoid arthritis-associated ILD. This uh, protein, this MUC5B, which is one of the most abundant uh, mucus proteins in the respiratory secretions, and it's involved in more of the defense mechanisms against bacteria and viruses. We know that by far this is the strongest genetic risk factor for IPF, and when studies have been done in other connective tissue diseases, we're seeing that this is even noticed in rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD, and now we're seeing that in patients who have ILD in the setting of anchor associated vasculitides, they tend to be positive for this uh, mutation, or it's, it's quite common, so we call it more of a polymorphism than anything else. And the green basically is staining the bronchiolar epithelium, and this is a mucus protein produced by the mucosal glands and by the goblet cells, and like I said, it's the most abundant mucus protein that we have. And this busy cartoon just goes over saying that MUC5B, environmental exposure, infection, all of these activate this complex system of inflammation that eventually leads to fibrosis. And the reason why I say this is because in the past, the thought process of ILD in ankle associated vasculitis was that, or oh, is it because of chronic hemorrhage or recurrent episodes of hemorrhage that these patients end up with scarring in the lungs? And the reason why we moved away from that is the best example we have of hemorrhage and fibrosis in the lungs comes from cases of long standing mitral stenosis. Those patients can get a little bit of recurrent hemorrhage in their lungs because of elevated. Uh, venous pressures with some bleeding in the lungs. It's very common to see some hemorrhage over there. Uh, 
But the kind of fibrosis we see in mitral stenosis because of recurrent hemorrhage tends to be just fibrosis in the septum, in the alveolar interstitial septum. Whereas over here, we get this complete architectural distortion that starts out in the periphery and is very patchwork, just like IPF, and that just moves its way into the center of the lung. So we think it's more than just hemorrhage doing this, and we think it's more complex with genetic factors, environmental factors, aging, et cetera, that antibodies that causes this interstitial lung disease. And just like most interstitial lung disease, the EFTs tend to be a restrictive pattern. And the more important thing is, or the worrying thing for us is that when you follow these patients over time, their lung function tends to decline. Unlike say, for example, we, we talk about rheumatoid arthritis associated ILD. And we say those patients have a UIP pattern, but one of the things we do know that even though this pulmonary fibrosis, they tend to progress not too fast, a little slower, but these patients go down at a pace. The BAL findings, most often you see mainly neutrophils. Sometimes you can see some hemocytin laden macrophages, and occasionally we see some lymphocytes in it, but it's predominantly a neutrophilic lavage. So the imaging, um, I think, just like I said initially, this is primarily a UIP pattern. And when we talk about a UIP pattern of imaging, the, the, the best example you have over here is the one that says definite UIP, where you see honeycomb changes, et cetera. Most of these patients do not have overt honeycombing, but they have changes that they call either a probable or indeterminate UIP pattern. Approximately 15 to 20% will have this NSIP pattern, which is the most common pattern seen in patients with CTD, ILD, but in anchor associated vasculitides, it's mainly a UIP pattern that we see. And I think this is a key uh, slide that looks at surgical lung biopsy features in patients with anchor associated vasculitides related ILD. One is from Japan, the other one is from here, from the Mayo Clinic. Um, nine patients, 18 patients, even though the lung biopsy showed UIP, meaning a patchwork pattern of fibrosis with fibroblastic foci, the important thing for us is the nuance, the details. There were additional areas of airway inflammation with bronchiolitis. They had lymphoid follicles. They had infiltrates with lymphocytes. And just like the initial case that came out of the Mayo Clinic, none of these cases, at least the one that came out of Japan, had any evidence of vasculitis or hemorrhage. Similarly, the one that came out of uh, here, the United States, again, showed UIP, but had additional inflammatory features, especially airway inflammation, lymphoid follicles, and only one out of these 18 cases showed small vessel vasculitis. So the bottom line is the absence of small vessel vasculitis in these biopsies should not preclude us from thinking that this is ILD related to anchor associated vasculitides. It's the other features that suggest an inflammatory uh, pattern to the UIP that should make us think something is going on rather than bland fibrosis. So outcomes. We know that patients with ILD versus those without ILD tend to have a much worse outcome. And when we look into more details into the pattern of lung involvement, those that have a UIP pattern tend to have a little bit worse outcomes than those with a non-UIP pattern. When we look at this even Further into the amount of fibrosis in the lungs or the presence of honeycombing, the more the scar, obviously the greater the degree of impairment to the lungs, the worse the outcomes. And honeycombing is just a manifestation of advanced scar in the lungs. Those patients tend to have worse outcomes as well. So all of that being said, how do we treat this? 
it's very clear for you how to treat anchor associated vascular disease manifestation. It's, it's uh, you just gotta follow whatever Carol and Alex and Rula have written and you are set. But when it comes to ILD, you're like, I, what do we do? So this was one of the studies that came out in France. They have two big groups. One is uh, run by Hilaire Nunez and the other is run by Vincent Cotan. I mean, in pulmonary, there's a lot of political factions, nothing like that exists in rheumatology. So um, this was the first group, the Nunez group that published this uh, of 49 patients. Major majority of them had MPA. Just like I said, many of them, the vast majority, it proceeded. 57% had UIP. And they looked at, should we treat them just with corticosteroids or should we use corticosteroids plus immunosuppression? And they showed that when patients were treated with corticosteroids plus immunosuppression, and when I say immunosuppression, it's the induction regimens that you guys use of either rituximab or cyclophosphamide. And those patients had better outcomes than steroids alone. Then the other group, I said, Vincent Cotan, they said like, well, they can't be the only ones publishing, so we're gonna publish as well. So they published their experience. And again, uh, it was very similar. Most of them had a UIP pattern. Most of the patients were treated with either cyclophosphamide and rituxan in combination with steroids. And they found that outcomes were better when these patients were treated with combination therapy. And when they looked at it further based on the imaging pattern that was affecting the lungs, they showed that the NSIP pattern of patients when treated like this tended to have similar outcomes as anchor associated vascular disease without ILD. They had great outcomes, long survivals. But the UIP patients still had worse outcomes, but better than no treatment at all. And then finally came this, this is a busy slide, but I put it in over here because many of you could be thinking, what about lesser intensive treatments such as mycophenolate or azathioprine or even methotrexate? So this came out of the UK where they showed this as an abstract form and they had an interesting mix of both C anchor and P anchor patients. And approximately 23 of the patients did not receive treatments and here in the UK, the most common modifying agent used was either mycophenolate or azathioprine for, or methotrexate. And they found that even with these lesser intensive medications, there was some improvement in PFDs. However, they did not show, break it down into were the vast majority of patients a UIP pattern or an NSIP pattern, but they showed that in these patients, a lesser intensive regimen could be considered, or like what you guys do is you induce them and then get them onto something that's not as intense. So is there some sort of a position statement of, how to treat these patients. And they say it should be individu individualized with a multidisciplinary approach. And Dr. Chatterjee knows all about it, that ILD is all about the multidisciplinary approach, which is as rigorous as science gets with his opinion, the pulmonologist, the radiologist, the pathologist, and Dr. Specs from uh, the Mayo Clinic tried to come out with this statement to say, if you have evidence of vasculitis, then you treat them according to your guidelines. In the absence of vasculitis, you do choose immunomodulating agents in those with an NSIP pattern and in those with a UIP pattern that do have an inflammatory pattern on their biopsies. If it's just bland UIP without any evidence of inflammatory changes, and they're just anchor positive, you can take a path of just serious surveillance and not treat them. So I'll finish with this whole concept of what is multidisciplinary diagnosis. And since we need a good discussant for it, 
I photoshopped Dr. Chatterjee's face as the clinician, and this is what the clinician says. The thing has been making barking sounds for three years. It behaves a lot like a dog. The radiologist goes, but it has four legs, could be a dog, just like all radiologists, they never ever commit. Could be a cat, could be a hippo, could be a rhino. And then of course the pathologist, who's all about details, they says, I can't classify it, but it's got the body of a rhino and the head of a chicken. And so Chatterjee, like the way he is, he says, pathologists are just weird. We're gonna call it a dog. And then the radiologists, because they always acquiesce to the clinicians, they say, okay, for sure. And the pathologist says, fine, it's your patient, call it what you want. So that's how a multidisciplinary diagnosis works. We call this a dog. All right, so in summary, we know that there's an association between ILD and vasculitis. A majority of these are in the setting of anti-MPO. You can see fibrosis without systemic involvement. The main pattern is a UIP pattern. Treatment is still being developed, but the recommendation is combination immunosuppression and further trials are being done to look at the role of antifibrotics in this disease. Thank you. Our last talk is about cardiac manifestation in vasculitis, and uh, this is going to be presented by Dr. Heba Wasif, who is a uh, clinical cardiologist in the Department of uh, Cardiology here at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, she's also the director of inpatient clinical cardiology. Dr. Wasif has interest in uh, uh, cardiac manifestation and uh, cardiac evaluation in patients with systemic inflammatory diseases, and we are very fortunate to have you here today. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about the next neighbor in the chest, apart from uh, the pulmonologist, we'll be talking about the cardiac manifestations in vasculitis. And my objective in the coming few uh, minutes is to outline the spectrum of cardiac manifestations in vasculitis, to illustrate specific cardiac manifestations and outline management strategies uh, with a focus on large vessel vasculitis, since this topic is very um, uh, large and, and it's difficult to contain it within a 20-minute talk, and to recognize the rare etiology of myocardial involvement on, in vasculitis. Um, uh, I don't have to go over the slide for this audience, but vasculitis is big and small and also medium in size. Um, however, in the cardiac manifestations in uh, vasculitis can affect uh, any structure in um, uh, the cardiovascular system, but in varying uh, degrees. So we can see that uh, we can see manifestations of pericarditis, myocarditis, uh, valve disease, epicardial coronary disease, uh, microcirculation, uh, uh, as well as intracavitary uh, thrombi. Um, and with, uh, I will go into some of these uh, details in the upcoming uh, slides. So I will start off with uh, a first case. Uh, she's a 51-year-old woman with Takayasu's arthritis that was diagnosed about 14 earlier than her current presentation. She also had history of gestational diabetes, asthma, and history of aortic regurgitation that has been followed closely. Uh, she's been intermittently on glucocorticoids, and at the time of her presentation, she was uh, short of breath and was experiencing some lightheadedness and dizziness with uh, exercise. Uh, she underwent a cardiac echo to evaluate uh, the degree of aortic regurgitation that has been followed up uh, for years. And uh, as we can see here on the uh, uh, left upper corner, uh, I guess I don't, there is no pointer here, uh, we see some degree of aortic regurgitation uh, in the parasternal uh, view. Uh, and as we go through the different uh, images, uh, we assess that this is a severe aortic regurgitation. And we see the cardinal sign on echo uh, that this severe aortic regurgitation when there is flow reverser in um, uh, the right lower corner uh, of the screen. Um, she undergoes a TEE to have further evaluation of uh, her valve. Uh, and we can clearly see that the valve leaflets in the uh, upper uh, left corner of the screen, that the valve leaflets have very thickened edges. Uh, and they are retracted with a central gap or coaptation, uh, gap with severe aortic uh, regurgitation. Um, um, in, um, in the lower uh, slide, we can also see that there's some thickening in the aortic uh, wall. Uh, 
she undergoes uh, a cardiac MRI to assess the degree of activity of uh, disease, and there was some uh, circumflexion, circumfle circumferential wall thickening of the ascending aorta arch um, as some of the branches, and I'm sorry, this is going a bit uh, fast. But it was quite clear that she's symptomatic from her severe aortic uh, regurgitation, and she underwent uh, coronary angiography to evaluate uh, her underlying coronary artery disease to determine the appropriate management strategy uh, for her. And as we can see also from the coronary angiography preoperatively, on the left hand of the screen, that she has a subtotal occlusion of her left main, and uh, we see some flow through the LED, but it's mostly provided by collaterals from the RCA, um, as we can see that the, her RCA on the right hand side uh, is completely uh, normal. It's a large vessel providing these left, right to left uh, collaterals. So she undergoes coronary artery uh, bypass with in situ uh, lima to the LED, as well as replacement of her aortic uh, valve utilizing a 24 uh, a 25 millimeter Edwards Inspirus Resilia bovine pericardial uh, aortic valve, in other words, uh, the bioprosthetic uh, valve. Uh, and her pathology showed the semilunar valves with moderate cusp edge of fibrosis, uh, which makes uh, a whole lot of sense, especially with the image that we see on uh, the TE. Um, so I always say that the eye sees only what the mind is prepared to comprehend, and we can see from, from this particular case, I've highlighted two major uh, vascular or cardiac uh, manifestations of Takayasu, where a uh, patient has uh, severe aortic regurgitation as well as severe coronary artery uh, disease. So I go back to the cardiovascular manifestations of Takayasu's, and it's no surprise that 40% of patients will have some degree of cardiac manifestations to variable degrees. Uh, we see a high incidence of hypertension, understandably so, with the degree of vascular involvement. But we cannot forget about coronary artery disease or aortic regurgitation that also play a major uh, role with these patients. Um, coronary artery disease is seen, at least on imaging, at least 60% of the time, but whether the patient is symptomatic or not, that's about 20 to 30% of the time, also depending on uh, how uh, big of a study and what the case series is. Aortic regurgitation, for the most part, is seen at least in 40% of patients, and one should be aware of and probably screen for it. However, in spite of having 40% uh, of patients having cardiac manifestations, uh, the uh, ACR criteria uh, for uh, Takayasu, which was um, 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 uh, pr uh, essentially the, uh, devised in the early nine, in 1990, uh, it focuses mostly on uh, the vascular component of Takayasu with uh, no mention uh, of uh, either coronary artery disease or valve uh, disease. Uh, however, the modified uh, Ishikawa criteria does make um, an honorable mention for aortic regurgitation and coronary artery uh, disease uh, as minor uh, criteria of this uh, disorder. Uh, as we go along, I would like to bring to your attention also the angiographic classification of Takayasu's arthritis that I'm sure the audience is very familiar uh, with that divides this disorder into six subsets. And for the interest of coronary artery disease, we have to focus on any uh, uh, and the part of this disorder that affects the arch uh, and the aortic uh, root, and so we're really talking about uh, type 2B and type uh, 5. Uh, and in general, uh, coronary artery involvement in vasculitis is not only limited to Takayasu's arthritis, uh, but we can see also with polyarthritis nodosa that up to, uh, depending on uh, the study, up to 50% of patients will have some coronary uh, involvement. Um, it's relatively rare in giant cell arthritis, though it's not so rare, I've seen some studies where it's about 10% uh, uh, of the, the series, uh, to a lesser extent in uh, Bichette's and, and other uh, disorders. A very rare disorder that I personally have never uh, seen, Erdham's Chester uh, disease, uh, cardiac involvement is very high in this uh, disease. Going back uh, to uh, Takayasu's uh, arthritis, usually the involvement of the coronaries in Takayasu involves the ostia, in 60 to 80 percent uh, of patients, and to a lesser extent, uh, it's a diffuse uh, disorder, and occasionally we see uh, coronary aneurysm. Actually, it's more common to see coronary aneurysms uh, when there's no active uh, uh, disease. So, uh, unlike most 
uh, 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 coronary disorders, uh, we, the, the focus of the treatment is on immune suppression. Immune suppression, immune suppression. Uh, and it's only if the patient has uh, uncontrolled ischemia, that's where uh, intervention uh, would be uh, addressed. I do want to mention um, uh, a very, at least it's an interesting study from my perspective, um, the role of certain immune suppressants and the angiographic regression that you see um, uh, with coronary artery disease. And tocilizumab, a very small study, 22 patients, um, there was not uh, randomized, 11 uh, patients were treated with tocilizumab and uh, 11 patients treated with another uh, DMARD. And uh, CT uh, was performed uh, in patients with tocilizumab looking at the, the progression. And after six months, there was some regression of the osseal disease uh, seen in these uh, patients. And, and that's actually much more than what we would usually see in patients with atherosclerosis and treatment with uh, statin uh, therapy. Um, as far as uh, revascularization uh, strategies, um, uh, the two tool kit, uh, the two tools that we have in our kit, apart from medical management, is coronary artery stenting and bypass grafting. But these are not without caveats in patients with vasculitis, as uh, we're well aware that there's involvement of uh, the arch, which limits the use of um, uh, the lima in many uh, cases. And we also keep have to keep in mind any most of these intervention has have to be performed when the patient uh, um, is somewhat in remission and not having active. Uh, disease. So how do they compare? Like how does PCI compare to uh, revas to uh, bypass? How do they compare to medical therapy? And this is a relatively large uh, series of patients with Takayasu, almost 806 patients, of which about 10% had coronary artery disease. It's a recent cohort um, uh, from 2008 to 2019. Uh, therefore, reflecting uh, our modern uh, medical uh, therapy strategies, including uh, statins and dual antiplatelet therapy, as well as um, 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 uh, recent platforms of uh, drug eluting uh, stents. And uh, as we can see that uh, in terms of survival, there was no difference between a revascularization and medical uh, management. Uh, however, there was more uh, MACE uh, in the follow-up period between uh, uh, revascularization and medical uh, therapy as one would expect. There was more angina um, in the medical therapy uh, group. And when we specifically uh, look at patients who have undergone bypass compared to those who have undergone uh, cabbage, uh, there was no difference in survival as well, uh, which is also consistent with most trials with uh, comparing uh, BAP, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, I will uh, skip that. I will just talk about the slide next to it, um, where we see that there is an increased maze uh, between uh, cabbage and PCI, and that is primarily related to the restenosis, which is very problematic in, in these patients. Uh, therefore, we have to be very careful in, when uh, before the decision of to proceed uh, with uh, revascularization. And the rates of um, uh, uh, restenosis in PCI group was up to 40% uh, percent and uh, almost 9% in the bypass group. Uh, of note, though this seems like extremely high, in previous cohorts, uh, this is actually lower than what it was in the past, where some other cohorts have reported up to 60%, uh, again, reflecting uh, um, uh, newer therapies uh, in the toolkit that we have uh, currently. So we go back to our patient, uh, and we wonder what happened uh, to her. So she had an uneventful uh, postoperative course and actually did fairly well. But in her follow-up within uh, a year, she already had occluded her lima, which is extremely uh, rare, but clearly due to involvement of uh, the arch, uh, the lima was occluded, again, raising questions about what, uh, uh, how uh, to be very careful about managing uh, these patients uh, with um, revascularization strategies. Uh, uh, the other uh, issue that this patient highlighted is valvular involvement with Takayasu. Well, it's up to 40% in many series, and this is another large series of almost 1,100 uh, patients over a 25-year period. 
And we can see that almost a, a third of this cohort had val some degree of valvular involvement. Primarily, valve, uh, the aortic valve was involved. To a lesser extent, the mitral, the tricuspid, and the pulmonic valve. Um, uh, and the patients uh, that underwent uh, a valve replacement, uh, their pathology uh, was quite interesting. It showed myxomatous degeneration. Uh, with thickened adventitia and edema and atherosclerotic like plaque formation in the ascending aorta and not necessarily uh, active uh, disease. So it comes as no surprise uh, that the reason for the risk factors for valvular involvement in Takayasu is a dilated aortic root that increases uh, the risk uh, of aortic regurgitation, uh, but also active inflammation uh, has been associated with increased uh, risk uh, and uh, the type 2B uh, um, uh, uh, angiographic uh, classification where the aortic root is uh, involved. Um, therapies for valvular, uh, 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 for valve uh, management are not all created equal. And we can see that patients who undergo just valve replacement or valve repair have worse outcomes compared to patients who undergo valve replacement with the repair of the ascending uh, with the uh, root uh, and uh, sorry with the ascending aorta and that's primarily due to formation of pseudo aneurysms and dehiscence at the site of the anastomosis uh, so that's something also that is usually uh, kept uh, in mind in terms of uh, management strategies in patient with uh, valvular uh, disease so the the framework of uh, management of care is very complex and I, I like this uh, illustration uh, that was published in, in Jack very recently actually just earlier uh, this year and it highlights that this is uh, include that this framework includes early uh, diagnosis uh, as well as lifelong uh, surveillance uh, for optimal uh, long uh, uh, term uh, patient outcome and I will not be obviously discussing the immune suppression because that is beyond uh, my expertise. Um, my, I move to case number two. Um, uh, this is a 64-year-old woman with history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia who actually presented almost eight years ago with uh, chest pain and diagnosed with an end STEMI. Uh, she underwent coronary angiography at the time. She had left main disease, uh, LED disease, and left circumflex uh, disease. Um, and she underwent coronary artery uh, bypass at the time. Uh, her um, LV systolic function was preserved. She had mild aortic regurgitation, so the valve was not uh, repaired. And she had a borderline or upper normal uh, ascending aorta at 3.8 uh, centimeters. A few years later, she presented with worsening shortness of breath. Uh, and her echocardiogram, um, um, as we can see here, uh, is showing severe aortic regurgitation. So there has been progression of her aortic regurgitation within a uh, seven to eight year uh, uh, time frame. Um, uh, and given her symptoms uh, of shortness of breath and the presence of severe aortic regurgitation and progression also of the ascending uh, aorta, this is more pictures that uh, um, uh, kind, of, kind of highlight the degree of aortic regurgitation. Uh, she also underwent uh, a stress echo and during her stress uh, echo, uh, there was a reduction in her LV systolic function, highlighting uh, the need uh, uh, to proceed with valve uh, replacement. Uh, she underwent uh, a CT uh, at the time to, uh, to reassess uh, the size of the aorta, which was found to be about 4.5, and the root was 4.3 by 3.9. Uh, we did proceed with um, coronary angiography, since she's had, obviously, a, a previous coronary artery bypass. Uh, her grafts were patent, uh, and she only underwent aortic valve replacement. But was, what was a big surprise was a surgical pathology came back when was positive for giant cell uh, arthritis. And rheumatology obviously was consulted, and patient was initiated on steroid therapy and was currently in remission. When I went back into this patient's history, even at the time of her earlier presentation, she really had very minimal uh, uh, symptoms of uh, giant cell uh, arthritis, and I'll get that in that in a second. So inflammatory aortitis, um, the most common uh, cause, uh, um, sorry, um, um, giant cell arthritis and takayasu are the most common uh, cause 
However, other disorders, as you're well aware, uh, can also be involved. The other cardiac manifestations of giant cell arthritis, apart from aortic involvement, coronary artery uh, disease and stroke, uh, uh, that uh, have been seen in, in, in uh, they're not as low as some people think. I mean, it's it's been reported as about 1% coronary artery disease. There have been case, some case series that have reported it up to 10%. Uh, However, pericarditis and myocarditis is very uh, rare. Uh, when I, as I was mentioning, I went back to this patient's uh, history uh, to see if she fit any of the criteria, the ACR criteria. Uh, for giant cell uh, arthritis, and th she really did not have any uh, symptoms that have been uh, uh, reported. And it's not uh, unusual uh, that patient, that there is a delay in uh, the diagnosis uh, from the onset of uh, symptoms, uh, as this patient actually started to have symptoms after she was uh, diagnosed uh, on biopsy. Uh, what is very Im important to understand and know about uh, patients uh, who suffer from giant cell arthritis is that it's not only that this is a lifelong disease and ongoing uh, follow-up, even if they are in remission, as the risk of uh, large uh, of aneurysms does go up after five uh, years. Uh, as some reports have in said uh, have endorsed that one out of three patients will have uh, evidence of an aortic uh, aneurysm in the follow-up uh, period, and the current aortic guidelines emphasize the importance of uh, follow-up uh, with CT, MRI, or FDG PET, even if the patient is in uh, remission. Uh, I find uh, this is our uh, uh, operative uh, data from uh, the Cleveland Clinic um, um, over almost a 16-year period, where about 7,500 patients have undergone some, uh, some form of aortic uh, uh, surgery, and out of those, 2% have had aortitis on examination, uh, or on histologic examination, rather, and only 18% had symptoms uh, before the operation, which was very similar to our uh, uh, patient. Um, this brings me uh, to uh, my last uh, case of uh, the day, um, uh, and this is courtesy of one of our uh, fellows uh, who had presented this patient uh, in Morning Report a few months ago. Uh, it's a 46-year-old uh, male with history of uh, bilateral lens subluxation, and retinal detachment with sans marfanoid, um, uh, who presented to the ED for evaluation of peripheral edema and T-colored uh, urine. He had had symptoms uh, four weeks uh, prior to his initial presentation, and on his initial uh, examination, he was found to be hypertensive uh, with evidence suggestive of congestive heart failure. He had an elevated JVP. He had pitting edema uh, bilaterally. Um, and his chest uh, x-rays showed bilateral um, airspace infiltrates, um, uh, again, suggested that uh, of um, uh, fluid uh, retention. His initial cardiac echo, this is not his bedside echo, but it's consistent with his bedside echo. He had LV uh, uh, dysfunction and an estimated ejection fraction of about 20 to 30 uh, percent. Uh, his laboratory data none of them were uh, normal. And as we can see, he was hyponatremic, he was in renal uh, failure. He had markedly elevated enteroma pro BNP, and along with this LV dysfunction that's suggestive of some degree of myocarditis, uh, her uh, 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 troponin T was not as elevated. Uh, again, the, uh, this was the trigger that this was some form of myocarditis. CRP was significantly elevated, as well as his white count uh, and he was quite uh, anemic. Uh, he underwent uh, serologic um, uh, um, uh, lab findings, and what was quite interesting, that his complements uh, were low. Um, I, his ANA was negative, and uh, I'm obviously giving this away. His C anchor eventually came back, and it was uh, positive. He also underwent a renal biopsy, as we can see, with which confirmed the palsy immune Crescentic and necrotizing glomerulonephritis with severe activity and mild to moderate chronicity consistent with ANCA positive granulomatosis uh, with polyangitis. Um, so 
usually polyangitis, uh, granulomatosis with polyangitis usually affects the upper uh, airway and the kidney, and it's extremely rare that it does affect the myocardium. The largest series was about 160 patients uh, over a 24-year uh, period uh, that was uh, showed that less than 6 percent of patients had pericarditis, and only three patients had myocardial uh, involvement. And most of other cases uh, have been just uh, case reports. Uh, this patient was initially treated with steroids and uh, rituximab, and once he was treated with rituximab, we started seeing uh, an improvement of his general uh, chemistries. Uh, we also started seeing uh, an improvement uh, of um, uh, uh, all his other biomarkers. Uh, this is also, uh, this was a primarily imaging uh, study that uh, evaluated 31 consecutive patients with granulomatosis with polyangitis, and it was quite uh, interesting that about 16% 16 of these patients had some degree of pericardial uh, involvement, uh, sorry, myocardial involvement, and 26% had some pericardial involvement. So maybe the uh, the the, that there's more involvement than uh, where we think uh, there is, but it may not manifest uh, clinically. So just uh, to wrap up, and I hope I'm uh, on time, uh, is the, my take-home message is that, that the cardiac manifestations are variable and the frequency based on the type of vasculitis, that coronary artery uh, disease and aortic valve regurgitation are very common in Takayasu's arthritis, and obviously Takayasu and giant cell arthritis are common forms of aortitis, uh, myocardial involvement uh, is rare in, uh, uh, in GPA, uh, 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 and the clinical features of vasculitis are sometimes nonspecific, uh, particularly early in disease, and we have to be on uh, the watch, as I sometimes say, that sometimes I see patients in clinic for uh, fatigue and very vague constitutional uh, symptoms, uh, so one has to be on uh, the uh, whereabouts about some uh, of these vague uh, manifestations. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.